I'd like to welcome up one of my colleagues and take you through our next thing, John Cohn. I think uh, IBM Fellow actually means something completely different. I'll talk about that in a second. But I'm going to be talking, building on, on top of what Andrew just said, and thank you for taking the Spice Girls off. I'm going to talk about an application called Internet of Things. How many of you are Internet of Things hackers? Anybody do that kind of stuff? Good couple. Well, let me tell you a little bit about why I'm doing it. Andrew gave you uh, a little clue. Because I'm a fellow, it's because I'm old and funny looking that gives me the right to do this. But I've been building <clears throat> Internet of Things things since before the internet. And I could even argue maybe before things. I am a, uh, an artist. I do a lot of kind of interactive art. I'll tell you about that. I build large public things like seven meter tall statues, uh, robotic statues to scare kids, which is a good use of an MIT education. I made a, a cellular controlled flamethrower. Uh, I made a, I don't even know how to describe this, it's a seven meter tall hippie mobile for carrying naked hippies on the desert. Well, uh, and a, a, a 10 meter long keyboard. But these all have something in common, and that is that they are the internet of things. Now what, what is an internet of things? So we've been making things that kind of connect to the internet for a while, but three things have come together to make this an amazing time. Um, oh, wait, the one thing I wanted to do, can I take a selfie? Wait a minute. And at three, I need you to all say cheese in whatever your language is. You know, we say cheese. Okay, one, two, three. Cheese. Excellent, thank you. Blogger. Okay, so three things are coming together. First is like wicked cheap electronics, like Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, Beagle Bones, any of you have any of that kit at your house? You should get it. I know software nerds don't usually touch hardware. This is really a piece of solid software. So that is coming in, again, open source, kind of taking the, the clue from software. Ubiquitous connectivity, wireless connectivity. I couldn't figure out a good picture, so this is actually, I was actually on a reality show, like a survivor show, and they made me make a radio, and I couldn't find a better picture of a radio, so that's me and a radio. So the fact that we have cheap hardware, ubiquitous uh, communications, and ubiquitous intelligence, things like Bluemix that Andrew was just talking about, that the combination of cheap hardware, any connectivity, and amazing intelligence, like the stuff that you're gonna hear about with Watson next with Chris, makes it so that you can actually build anything, and you can start to change the world. You can start to change the physical world. Now, what is IoT? So it's, you know, you've got hardware at one end, you've got a cloud at the other end. I mean, does that mean that it's, you know, you, it's like a, an RFID tag. This is the thing that tries to stop you if you try to steal a CD or something. You know, this is a simple RFID tag. It's designed to be thrown away. Is that IoT? Or is like a nuclear reactor that has all sorts of com computation and telemetry? Or the space station? Well, the answer is, it's all of that. It's many of those things and anything in between. And I really mean anything. Uh, last week, I, I saw some people. Who's from Charles University in Prague? Prague people. Oh, there they are. Can I shine a laser at you? Um, I was walking. I was there a week before last with my wife. We were walking, and there was a statue that was an Internet of Things statue. The statue was made by a famous artist. And the idea is that you can text, just like the jukebox Andrew just showed, you text your name to the statue, and the statue writes your name in water. And, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Internet of things. Internet of things. It's really, your imagination is clearly the limit, and maybe your imagination should be a little bit more limited. But the thing is, it is just exploding. We've been doing this for a long time, but all of a sudden, it's like, Billions and billions, you know, we're, uh, we're kind of in the, you know, 10 billion range because even phones are considered things to be like Internet of Things. But by 2020, maybe in the somewhere between 15 and 50 billion, but they're saying by 2050, over 100 billion objects 
connected to the internet. A hundred billion objects, which means the code that you write can be talking to or listening to things that are gonna be in everything. Pills that we eat, cars, etc. Gonna be amazing? Also gonna be a little scary, and I'm gonna ask for your help in a little bit. Now, ask, why does IBM care about this? We don't make we don't make little chips and things like that, but we make data. We're about data. I don't know, do you remember the Harlem Shake? Here, that's me. Um, the big point that in 2013, during one month of February, there were 2,500 years worth of stupid Harlem Shake videos. And you know what? That was not the worst one. That was really good. But that was thousands and thousands of terabytes of data that was moved around, you know, uh, fed into Watson, stored, moved, etc. And if you start to look at the amount of data that that creates, it is just exploding too. And the number of sources, so for example, you know, things like social media are creating huge amounts of data. And for a company that sells storage and networking uh, supplies, that's not a bad thing. But why does it, oh, you know what's an interesting statistic? Somebody calculated that this year, about now, actually, right, right now, no, that, that, that we're gonna have enough, we're gonna have the same number of bits recorded in various means as there are st known stars in the entire known universe, which is, I guess, kind of an interesting statistic. But what's cool about it is that if, you know, if you look at like social media, oh, one, one quick shout out. Later on, we're doing some sort of a social media challenge called IoT Smash Cloud, Cloud Smash, Cloud Smash. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But the reason that IoT is such a big deal is when you talk about 100 billion things that are just tweeting out little bits of data, an airplane, like an A300 that, you know, I flew from um, JFK to London uh, last week, okay? Each of those engines creates 10 terabytes of data every half an hour. That means that while you're sitting there watching, you know, re-watching the Flintstones, you know, going from London or to New York or, or back, it generates 640 terabytes of data. Now, as Andrew said, very little of that ever gets looked at. I mean, you cannot ship that all down. And now we're trying to figure out, well, how can we actually put processing, how can we make insights out of it? Because doing IoT is not much fun unless you can change the equation, unless you can make the world better or people richer or something like that. So the whole thing is there's gonna be a ton of data out there and we're gonna need really, really, really smart uh, software people like you to figure out what's the magic in that, in this new oil. So the, just a little bit of work stuff is for us, um, IoT is really about solutions because very few companies actually, I mean, there's a lot of companies that go into Internet of Things just for the plumbing, you know, like how do I get the data in? But for us, it's all about gaining those insights. And so we have a platform idea that we have stuff down at the bottom, you know, and, and it comes in. There's over 250 different standards of the, the data formats. You think software is bad. Hardware is even worse because it's written by old people. Uh, but it comes up. And then we have, you know, we try to pull it into analytics. We might be trying to do optimization on it. We're trying to pull out data patterns, predict, et cetera. Then we, we put it into, put it up into things like asset management, et cetera. But eventually, the value to society, the value to business, is doing something cool with the data, doing something that changes an outcome. And so our big point is building all this infrastructure so that we and our partners can actually build um, industry solutions. And all of that really has to, to factor in security, it has to go top to bottom, and a little bit more about that later. But the kinds of things that I get to work on, and by the way, you know, I don't know if you noticed, Andrew was wearing a shirt, you know, about Cloud Foundry, that's what he does. I just joined the IoT area, we announced it in January. It's so new, we didn't even have a shirt, so I made this this morning. So, that's dynamic, okay? But we have been doing this in various pieces, but it's all been pulled together. IBM just announced that we're gonna be spending $3 billion on Internet of Things, and I get to spend it. <laughs> no, I, well, actually, that's not true. But, and no one's out there, no one's a manager out there. Um, but the kinds of things that I've been working on is, for example, connected cars. 
you probably know that there's, there's maybe a hundred embedded microcontrollers inside your car that are controlling everything from the brakes to the stereo. But more and more cars are coming out with telemetry back to the cloud. And there's a couple of things that are really important about that. They're being used to monitor the engine and do predictive maintenance. You know, a little light that comes on and says, you know, your car is screwed up. That's not very intelligent, right? We're able to now work with, with some of these larger car manufacturers, and, and not only can we interpret what the data says, and you know, either says, you know, you can do this next time you come in and we'll pre-order the part, or step away from the car, it's about to explode. So we can do that a little bit better. But the best thing is, is using the advanced analytics. We can sort of predict, you know, when something's going wrong. Like we started detecting in these big mining thing, mining equipment, that when we kept seeing the side mirror break, that we knew that the suspension was broken. I mean, sounds obvious, but you have to really look at the data. This is actually a, a, a car company called Local Motors that actually 3D prints 80% of their cars, and we're helping with that, which is pretty cool. Um, we're working in healthcare. You know, the idea of, like, in the, in the uh, Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, we're taking in data from, you know, if you ever go into, I hope you don't have to do this often, but if you go into a hospital, you know, there's all these things beeping and poking and, and stuff stuck to you. Well, again, pulling all that together and making sense of it is so important. We did a project around respiratory failure in newborn babies, and instead of just detecting when they were in, in, in struggling and trying to react, again, we were looking at sort of predictive maintenance. We were looking at data regressions and saying, you know, when their temperature starts to do this kind of fluctuation, and their saline, I mean, their um, the ion levels do this, two days later, they're going to have a respiratory crash. And we started to be, we had much better outcomes. Again, by using Internet of Things, prior knowledge, and statistical modeling. The whole healthcare thing is kind of merging in with the smart home, kind of the whole play there. And that is where we're, we're actually uh, trying to keep people at home who aren't that sick. So like in the town of Bolzano, Italy, we've got uh, elder care. Uh, so we have uh, instrumented a bunch of old people. And I'm starting to feel like, well, that's going to be me pretty soon. You know, so you can instrument them so that they don't wander off or leave fires on, et cetera. And they can report up like their blood pressure, et cetera, into the hospital. This is going to be, there's going to be so many innovations in health. That's one of the things I'm most excited about. But even in things that are in your house, your fridge, your, your refrigerator, your, your oven, uh, you know, people even want to make Internet of Things toasters. Yeah, you know, the market will decide whether you need a smarter toaster. But I will show you in a little bit about a project I've done with Samsung about making washers more autonomous. But the, you're really, there's going to be no end to where these things occur. They're already occurring very much in smart cities and streets. Uh, so, for example, anybody here from Stockholm? So Stockholm uh, uses our Internet of Things components to actually do road use charging. And the road use taxes that they put in actually funded uh, a lot of their public transport. So these are all Internet of Things, but the, the data coming down here has to, you have to find the gold in it. Now, Andrew talked about Cloud Foundry and Bluemix. Now, I want to tell you that until, I, you know, I kind of lied. I'm not even in the IoT group. I start two weeks. I've got a new job. I'm a hardware guy. I design chips for a living for 30 years. I've been designing big computers for IBM. But I love making things so much. And so when IBM got into IoT, I was so excited. And I started using the stuff. I was never, I wasn't paid to use the stuff that Andrew had. I just kind of liked it. And it's this whole thing. We call it Blue Mix. And what it is, is it's a collection of, of components that you can put together in so many different ways. And again, IoT is not just about, you know, hey, I can blink a light. It's about getting insights. What we've done in the last year is we've created a set of Internet of Things components that allow you to pull in data from the world, store that stuff as it's coming in at, at super high speeds, you know, millions of, of, of uh, trickles a second, and made it a full peer, like one of the hearts in Bluemix. So the interesting thing is, instead of having to like patch this whole thing together, the speed that Andrew was talking about, you can get together and quickly take the IoT data and start mashing it up with whatever your favorite, whether it's an open source cap uh, capability like MySQL or Redis or 
or a third party like Twilio or Square or geocoding from Pitney Bowes, or of course all of our stuff like Clouden, you know, web databases, or the really cool stuff that Chris is gonna to talk to you about in Watson. You're able to actually patch those together and start prototyping and show value very, very quickly. It is so much fun because it actually, I started using this for public art long before I knew I was gonna be working in it. And we'll talk a little bit about applications, but the one thing I would like to do, okay, you know, I get to be the old funny looking guy up here and you know, tell you when I was your age, I wish somebody had turned me on to some of these kind of tools. I would just invite you uh, to go check this out. If you go look at bluemix.net, you can use it for free, up to a point. I don't know what the money thing is, but you can, you know, it, for, for students, I think it, uh, you can use it up for, for a while for free. And you've got all these capabilities. There's tons of services, you know, like you want to play with Watson, you want to play with Internet of Things, or Internet of Things meets Watson. You, there's tons of recipes for things like, you know, uh, raspberry pies and Arduinos, any or your own hardware, you can make your own. It's very simple, standards-based programming, JSON, uh, MQTT, CoAP, RESTful interfaces. You can create your own and contribute them. There are many documents and tutorials, but a very vibrant community, support community, both here and in um, uh, uh, some of the community like uh, Slashdot, various other places. So go try this out, and if you just Google IBM IoT, you'll get there. So go try it, go try it. I'm gonna to talk to you about a couple of cool things that we built with it. Oh, my favorite, the favorite thing that I really like, there's a lot of components in there, but there's this great project called Node-RED. Node-RED is a pretty interesting thing. It, um, it's kind of a composition tool for, um, for wiring the Internet of Things. It is completely written in Node.js, and it was, um, it was actually put together as part of a hackathon for, um, am I blinking here? Yes? Okay, where'd you go? <laughs> and anyway, this is all controlled by, uh, yikes. It's controlled by uh, uh, this uh, Node Red. But Node Red is such an amazing piece of software. You can download it at nodered.org, completely open source. It's all extensible. There are now really, literally, hundreds and hundreds of these components. They're all done as individual NPMs. And anything you have, any kind of IoT object, weather, Twitter, et cetera, that you want, you can actually go and download that. You wire the things together, and it basically it multitasks things together. It is an incredibly good tool for wiring the Internet of Things. I would argue it's a pretty good thing for wiring just about uh, you know, any sort of uh, prototyping some software together. And if you want to take it off in a different direction, there have been quite a few people who have sort of forked this code and actually created some, some cool stuff for themselves. But this is one of the, the go-to tools that I use to make some stuff. Let me show you a couple of things that we've made. One of the first things that I thought was kind of cool is that uh, this almost saved a, a, the, the life of one of my friends. So um, Andrew mentioned that there are like 80 some odd IBM fellows, and they're all pretty weird people. But one of my favorite weird people is uh, Rhonda Childress. She is a who? But she, you know, we all spend a lot of time on airplanes, just kind of sitting on our, you know, whatever. And she was on an airplane uh, in August. And I don't know if you've ever heard about this, but she was sitting there too long and she got a blood clot in her leg. And the blood clot broke free and went into her lungs. And she was rushed to a hospital, intensive care, for three days. And she is not the kind of person who likes to sit, sit down. So she was lying there in her bed, just kind of going, no, no, no. And then she had this really cool idea. How could Internet of Things prevent, have prevented this, or how can it prevent it going forward? So she grabbed a really smart guy, a friend of mine, Mike Spisak, and they put together an application. This was also for an internal hackathon that uh, they basically took a, um, this little uh, device called a Wicked. It's, it's, it's like a $20, it's $19 US. Uh, it's got, uh, it's got uh, accelerometers, temperature, uh, humidity. Uh, it's got a buzzer in it. It's got light sensors and various other things. And it goes, it hooks up directly to our IoT foundation. Put that on, created a small Bluetooth low energy app, created an Android app 
using our Internet of Things cloud in Bluemix, use Node-RED, the, the application that I just turned on my headlamps with, and created a little user interface, but more importantly, it grabbed her calendar. And what it basically says is it says, okay, Rhonda, I know what you're supposed to be doing now. It has an accelerometer on the device, and it says, if you haven't got up and shaken it a little bit every 20 minutes, it says 20 minutes, the thing starts buzzing her. If it ignores it, it starts buzzing and beeping. And so other people tell her to get up and walk around. And that way, she's not gonna get another clot. Well, this was just done as kind of a hackathon thing. They're not taking this to market with a major company. I mean, it's gonna be not as, it's gonna be nicely packaged without a different brand. But this was really three days of hacking. It was actually 30 minutes to get a prototype and three days to refine it. This won our internal hackathon too, which was pretty cool. So you can actually, like, not only save money, you can save people. Now, um, other kinds of business, one, one of the things that I really enjoy is working with problems that have lots and lots of rich data. One of my favorite lo recent ones is through this guy, Silverhook, and Silverhook Boats. Uh, their, their CEO, it's a company in the UK, their CEO, Nigel, is a data scientist. He's a mathematician, like some of you, but he's also a racing geek. I don't know, do you, do you know these cigar boats? They go like 160 to 200 kilometers an hour in water like this. Well, two things that they needed to do. These boats cost upwards of half a million dollars, or sometimes up to a million dollars. They, people who are driving, they can get eight Gs of force, you know, because you're banging around like that, and they sometimes lose consciousness. So the engine can blow up, or the driver can blow up. So what they started to do is say, well, what can we do to instrument these things better? So not only do they need to instrument the boat, but they needed to instrument the people, because if the people conk out, the boat crashes, and that's bad. So they have a couple of things that they tried to do. They wanted to figure out how the race team could monitor the engine. They wanted to figure out how the officials could monitor compliance, like were they doing anything wrong. They wanted the fans to be able to check stuff out, but they also wanted to make sure that the people inside were still alive. Um, so they took about 70 sensors, a little bit more, throughout the boat and on the people. They took about 100 samples per second. They do some local analytics and they ship it up to shore, a compressed kind of signature of it every five seconds. And it kind of, and this was all using Node-RED and, and the IoT stuff. The change came about four years ago when IBM really took intelligence and analytics into a new realm. The immediate value is to so these are the all like just so that we have just simple uh, all the experts we need to give us advice kind of we need you're in doing. the cockpit while racing because they're now seeing the data. They're seeing what I'm seeing during the course of a race in real time, and they can give me advice on how to change aspects of the racing so that we have a better chance of winning. So what I really like is that now, after sitting in a desk for many years designing computer chips, I get to go out and look at crazy boats or out in deep sea, you know, the Internet of Things is bringing IT into the real world. I get to go all sorts of very cool places. Now, you know, another thing I want to pick up with Andrew is, you know, that thing about play? Not. I wouldn't say all IBMers are, you know, grown-ups. Uh, I've, I've attempted to uh, not become a grown-up. But I, I want to give you, you know, the one piece of advice, you know, I remember what it was like sitting in a chair like this and watching some old guy go, when I was your age. I want you to hear me and, and reinforce what he said, is that that issue of play, whatever you do, whether you go into academia, whether you go work for any one of these companies, whether you do a startup, this whole notion of keeping playful, keeping that alive in your, in your life is so important because what I found after 34 years, between my wife, my father-in-law and I, I've been at, we've had 78 years of working at IBM, 78 years. And I found that the people who are still loving it, and I still love it, and are still productive, and I argue I'm still productive, are the people who keep that playful spirit in their work. And that means that they try stuff they, they, they use it for fun, they hack around, they're not too worried about making mistakes. So I've been using this stuff to play as well, long before I took this job. So I do a lot of public art. Okay, so this is a, two, this is a capability, I, uh, an art piece. There's a, a, a funky museum. I live in Vermont. Any, anybody from the US here, you know, what, you know where Vermont is? 
Nobody knows where Vermont is. It's kind of a state full of hippies. It's the smallest state, we're the most liberal, we have the best ice cream, but nobody really does much there. But we love our art. And there's a museum there called the Firehouse Gallery. Firehouse Gallery was built in an old firehouse, oddly enough. And the firehouse had these gritty glass bricks down there. And they said, you know, they, they put out a commission. They said, well, what can we do with them? So myself, a bunch of college students, some high school students, my son and I put together a, a, a proposal and we, we won the bid. And we basically put about a thousand lights under there. There's two connect cameras looking down. And basically, you can, it can follow you around. You can play pong with it. Just do my thing. So, now. All of this is running on the infrastructure that I was talking about, our IoT capabilities and Blue Mix. And again, I was using it before I had to use it for work. It just, I, I had everything else. I had Amazon, I had everything else. It just turned out that this was the easiest and most productive way for me to put together all of these code components. And what's interesting is, you know, I wanted to create an experience that people could play with it um, even when the museum wasn't there. So what we wanted to do, this is the, this is the capability, this is using a bunch of open CV. It kind of can see the top of your bald head, if you have a bald head, you know, and kind of look around and, and it detects people and moves, moves around. But I wanted to give an experience, so we created this thing called flourish.mybluemix.net that allows you to, from any connected object, you know, a phone or a tablet, you can go right on this thing and it'll write on the floor. Now occasionally, and ironically I might add, this is node red again, occasionally we get connectivity problems because the city owns the firewalls to this and it stops being able to communicate over one of the channels. So I needed some way for it to tell me when it couldn't reach one of these servers. So I used node red, it basically has a little heartbeat in there that every 30 seconds it says, I'm okay, I'm okay. And if it misses one of those, it uses a third party tool called Twilio. Anybody use that? It's awesome. And we put this thing and it will phone me and say, Daddy, please restart me. A couple of months ago, my wife and I were in Peru at Machu Picchu and we were on the bus going up there and my phone went off and it said, please restart me. And so before we left wireless, I was able to restart. Ironically, uh, just as I was walking up here to, uh, to give this talk, it just phoned me to say it's crashed. It's crashed right now. I've got to go check it out. But go look at flourish.mybluemix.net or come and check us out in the chill zone and we can play with it. But again, it was not that much code and it was using the infrastructure that Andrew was just talking about. Now, I mentioned play. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I got announced as I'm joining this IoT group. But last fall, the IBM advertising uh, kind of out external outreach folks reached out to me and they said, You've been, I've been talking about this importance of play. And that's, if you forget everything else I say, just please remember that. They were trying to figure out, well, what do we do with this play and how does IoT intersect with social media? So our ad agency, yeah, they flew me down to New York, put me in a nice hotel, took me out to dinner, and they said, what's the weirdest thing you can think of for IoT? So long story short, how many of you use Tumblr? Anybody use Tumblr? So Tumblr is a social thing, network. It's a little bit like Instagram meets Twitter. It's got some very strange things in it, but there is a Tumblr site that IBM has called IBM Blur. And when first I was like, what would a Tumblr site from an IBM site, would it be like trying to sell you stuff? It has nothing to do with selling. It's all about creativity and science, and it is really, really good. But they were trying to figure out how do they increase the engagement? So the, I, the challenge was, could we build a physical device that would allow people to interact using social media, like likes, reblogs, um, uh, uh, signups, and various things. So, we brainstormed and created this crazy thing, and this is what happened. If you think about getting more students to go into technology, it can't be just about textbooks and following the rules. So science, you know, we were trying to figure out, you know, how do we get this notion to play? I want to show you something. Come with me. 
I'm John Cohn, IBM Fellow. Let's see what we got back here. We rented this small, funky building, and we built this thing. All using the same... It's called the Play Machine. That's a new interface we built with our IBM Tumblr page. When somebody engages with IBM work, if you do a like, it will actually drop a kernel of that popcorn and pop it. So I had a if you gun. share one of these links, it'll spin the globe and shine a laser on where you are. Every time somebody reblogs, this razor sharp axe thing will come up and start chopping. And if you do a follow, it'll actually find your ID and print it out on one of these crazy things. <laughs> We're trying to figure out how can we interpret social media data in kind of a fun and cool way. And we just let anybody come in and knowledge. play with it. This is Node Red. See, that was talking about. The interesting thing is that camera right there is watching. Hello, Internet. are wired to play. We learn as kids to play, but when we grow up, somehow that gets lost. Nothing makes me happier than watching somebody reawaken to that love of science. It's never too late. Yeah, I'm glad you guys wandered by. So, when we built that, I was like, who would ever go there? 17 million people went and popped popcorn and did stuff like that. So this is kind of fun. This is being able to take what you do, which is massive, awesome coding, and make it do something in the physical world. Now, just kind of closing up a little bit. I love IoT. It is just exploding. It is a very hot place where people who have hardware and software skills can come together and change the world. But it is not without its problems. I want to talk about something that the, the, the kind of main project that's occupying my mind and kind of ask for your help. I think there's three problems. You know, when we're going to get to 100 billion connected things, there's three things that are going to get us in the way, I feel. And we've been writing some papers on this and generating some, let's just say, controversy. So the first is cost. Yeah, I can imagine hooking 10 billion things, but 100 billion, 200 billion things? That's a lot of infrastructure. How are we going to do that? How are we going to make that scale and make it robust? More importantly, what about trust? Do you trust everything on the internet? Come on. No, you can't trust anything. And I'm not talking about, it's not a question of whether it's the governments are good or the, there's good guys or bad guys. Trust, security, and especially privacy are going to be huge here. I just told you that your car and your refrigerator and your heart pacemaker are going to be hooked up to the internet. Does that scare you? Because you can infer so much stuff about your personality. And at the worst, it could do, you know, somebody, it, somebody could do you mischief, you know, could crash your car. But I'm worried, I'm much more worried about them spamming me with ads all the time. You know, so we have to figure out how do you actually take care of trust, security, and privacy of 100 to 200 billion things. And finally, the longevity, okay? You know, if you take an app, you write an app, and you know it's going to probably be obsolete in a year, you don't mind, you're going to write another app. You got a car, a refrigerator, a space station, it's gonna be there for decades, two, three, maybe four decades. Think about having all this embedded software out there. There's software on these little chips and stuff like that, and they're hooked up. Do you think that somebody's gonna watch those things for two decades? Do you know, how many of you know about Heartbleed? The, the, yeah, right. How, who wrote Heartbleed? Probably one of you guys. Well, the thing is, is, is it going to be, whose job is it going to be to go find out that I sold that car to my brother, the, my brother trashed the car, somebody else stole the car, now somebody else in another country is driving it? Do you think the car manufacturer is going to be able to track that down, or it's going to be economically feasible? We need to figure out these devices. They need to be autonomous enough to take care of themselves, so when something bad happens, like a security bug or a safety bug, that they can update themselves. And this is a completely different thing. So let me leave you on this thought. I'm working on a really interesting set of problems about how do we build the scalable, 
private and secure Internet of Things. And we're trying to figure out, like, what if you started from a clean slate of paper? So we're trying to expo expand our cloud-based infrastructure. Everybody's sort of doing it like that. You have the cloud at the top, you have the IoT device at the bottom. And talking about more, how do we become more peer-to-peer -peer decentralized, and how do those worlds fit together? So I've been leading a project called ADEPT. We've been doing with companies like Samsung, and we're looking at how, what are the problems of doing a completely decentralized Internet of Things? Decentralized anything is kind of hard. It has some real advantages, it has some real disadvantages. So we started out with three components, peer-to-peer -peer messaging using a capability called, uh, by uh, my friend Jeremy Miller called Telehash, which uses distributed hash tables instead of a local, you know, so there's no, the whole point is not having a central point of failure and a central point of security uh, sensitivity. So we've done our messaging, like open the door lock. We're using peer-to-peer -peer messaging uh, using D8, uh, distributed hash tables and Telehash. Sometimes you have to send big pieces of data. It might be a log file going up or a binary file replacing something going down. For that, we use BitTorrent. Everybody knows BitTorrent, right? You know how it works? There's no central repository. It uses distributed hash tables. But the big question, and the kind of controversial thing, is how do you actually do device coordination? How do you actually get all of these things with the right authentication and permissions to actually cause all these to articulate that is not completely centralized. So we've been working with the blockchain. Do you guys know what the blockchain is? I'm not supposed to say anything about cyber currencies or anything like that. We're not using, we're not using cyber currencies, but the underlying technologies of these distributed, uh, these distributed pieces of ledger have some amazing properties. So we're using something called Ethereum. Anybody heard of that? Well, I want to leave you with this thought. Ethereum is a blockchain manipulation tool. It was written by a guy named Vitalik Buterin. Vitalik was 17 when he had the idea. 19, when he was living in Canada, he put this code out there. He's now 21. Last year, he won the International Technology Prize, along with Elon Musk, $1 million. And he's just like you. He's just like you. He is just like glowingly smart. And I believe that the next Vitalik Buterin is in this audience. And you're gonna come up with something, and I believe. I would really love anybody out there who's interested in these distributed systems and distri distributed security models, I would love to talk to you at the chill zone because this is going to change the world. Or better yet, if we don't fix this problem, the world's going to change in ways we may not like. So with that, um, I, can I, do I have time for a quick demo? Okay. So please, please, please come visit us in the chill zone. Talk to us. We've got like, what is it, data geek? If you want to talk to an IBM person to sort of figure out, especially if you've got solutions in this area. And what my friend Jake here is going to show, we've got some cool demos that use Bluemix that Andrew was talking about and some of our IoT capabilities. And what you got for us? Ah! <laughs> what? I don't know. You want mine? Here, we just kind of tag team. All right. Me and John will be real close together right now. So I'm going to show you guys what we're going to have later. Also, uh, at the IBM Chill Zone. That yeah. on me. Yeah. I'll get your cool headband too. Yeah. No, all right. There you go. Good point. Let's put this down on the floor for me. You want sure? Uh, we'll do that later. Uh, I think we're still wired together, man. Yeah. All right, I'll come with you. No, no, here. Take that. This is too much. This is why we need better technology, folks. All right, so what John has here is a Sphero. Sphero is an IoT connected device, and the way I'm going to connect with it right now is through Bluetooth. It's flashing blue, which means I'm connected to it. And I'm going to use the app, a native app that my team built to connect directly to it. And starting now, I'm going to be able to control it. Now, what's so cool about this, right? The cool thing about this little guy right here is that it's not just rolling around on the floor, talking with my phone. This app right here in my hand is connected to an application we have hosted in Bluemix. And the way this is connected is through the service John has been talking about this whole time, IoT Foundation. What IoT Foundation allows us to do is bi-directional asynchronous communication between this phone, which is gaining data from that ball and telling me the speed, the telemetry, the events that are happening to it. Unfortunately, the camera's disappeared somewhere, but I can see it. That seems to work. 
So to check it out in more depth, come over by the Chill Zone. I'll show you how to drive it, how we're sending data back and forth between this ball and the app. I'll show you how to drive it from any web console anywhere. And I'll let you drive it yourself. And the technology behind it is the exact same technology powering all the presentations that John showed today. The health presentation, the heart monitoring presentation, the boat presentation, the same technology that's available there is available to you through Bluemix powering this thing. And we'll go through it if you come by today. Thank you very much, Jake. So come by and play with some of this stuff because it's really fun, really fun. So I have the pleasure of introducing a friend of mine, Chris Madison, who is a, an application developer in our Watson area. And Watson is our new cognitive computing uh, engine that is just absolutely fascinating. And so do you, what do you need? You need headbands or you need any of this stuff? You've got a real shirt. Okay, here you go. Thank you very much. Follow the 2015 World Finals at icpcnews.com and be sure to check out my ICPC.